Sh shall I start then? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit nervous, so um, please bear with me if I stutter or what have you. Um, okay. Um, well, obviously, I'm Ant Stevens. Um, I've been like being an artist, I suppose, for since about 2010. Um, I suppose I'll give a little bit of background about kind of like how that came about, really, because um, I, I never intended, I mean, you know, growing up or anything like that, I didn't intend to be an artist. Um, I've sort of, um, apart from working in art, sort of now, I also work for kind of like a, a grassroots mental health charity. It's like all peer led. And um, most of my work in life has always been sort of like in the mental health field in some capacity. So um, that's kind of what I've pretty much always done since I was, um, what, 20, 21? Um, so yeah, I thought kind of like, I'd just start off really and um, say, and explain a little bit about how I became an artist. Um, so it kind of goes back to uh, 2010, sort of end of 2010. And, um, I was going through a, a, a really, really difficult time. I sort of like with my mental health experiences have kind of always been, um, I suppose as a teenager, they were particularly bad. And then in my twenties, I sort of just squashed everything down and kind of, um, yeah, kind of did life, but kind of um, was still quite dysfunctional kind of in my private life, but yeah sort of managed to get through my 20s okay and then in my 30s it just felt like kind of everything erupted and came back up to the surface so it sort of happened yeah at the end of 2010 and um I remember uh driving over I was going over to Hastings to um have dinner with my um partner's mum and um it was a Sunday afternoon and I've done like a, a Buddhist practice for about 14 years which I've always found really really useful um and there was a lot going on and I remember sort of as we were driving over I was chanting a lot because I was really worried about I thought you know I was going to basically lose my shit and have, have a little bit mini breakdown sort of over the, like the Sunday roast so I was trying, trying to keep myself together in the car sort of by chanting and trying to keep everything at bay as it were and it was whilst we were driving along we hit Hastings seafront and kind of um I can only describe it as kind of like this little inner voice popped in and I'd not experienced this really before and it sort of said the answer to your prayer lies within your current circumstances and my initial reaction to this was kind of like this this is bullshit because this is like probably the worst period of my life I've ever experienced but there was this little bit kind of this other part of me I guess that kind of went along with that and um I sort of shifted my attitude a bit rather than sort of like trying to push everything away and sort of um, <sighs> appear normal. Um, I kind of shifted my attitude to one of kind of like, okay, then if this is the answer to all my prayers, you know, thank you. And as I was kind of changing my attitude whilst I was chanting with this kind of, it was almost like, and I guess visually um, in my mind, if I try and explain it, it's almost kind of, if you could imagine sort of like, you know, you see pictures of India and like the, some of the beaches are really polluted and they've got loads of rubbish and plastic bags and stuff on top of them. It was almost kind of like, that was how I was feeling. There was all this rubbish. Then all of a sudden I just like dropped down into this kind of um, pure water. And it, I just felt the most overwhelming sense of okayness and peace. And it sort of, I didn't, never experienced that before but at the same time it felt familiar and it felt like it was coming from within me but at the same time it was coming from without and it was all these different sort of um, paradoxes and it was just kind of like the most remarkable thing I've ever experienced and over the course of that year sort of um, the following year 2011 sort of like things drastically changed in my life where um the job that I'd got at that time, I was working in sort of like uh, managing sheltered housing schemes, that kind of fell through. And I suppose on the surface of things, things felt like they got worse. And um, during sort of that year, heading towards the summertime, I remember walking around the lanes in Brighton and I was quite, um, you know, I, I had no job, no money. My mental health was kind of really shaky. I, you know, I wasn't particularly feeling in a very good place. And I just felt like this need to 
do something. And I remember walking around the lanes in Brighton and there used to be this dress shop and it used to make um, like 1940s style dresses out of like really mad fabrics and what have you. And um, they were selling like these massive bags of scrap fabrics, um, like all the offcuts from the dresses and stuff. Like I think it was about five or six quid and you got this massive bag. But, um, I did note at a later date though, they, the bags got smaller and the prices got bigger, but at the time it seemed like a really good bargain. And so kind of like um, I took this bag home and sort of like just ticked it out on the floor. And I spent ages like just going through sort of like all the scraps and unraveling stuff and like putting bits in different piles and sort of like um, just examining everything. And it sort of occurred to me that this was like a little bit like the process that my life was, you know, like internal life was going through sort of um, everything seemed to have potential, all these fabric scraps, and I didn't throw anything away. I was just fascinated by them. And over the rest of that year, I sort of made maybe about nine or 10 kind of like small little collages from them. And in Brighton every year, we sort of have like um, an artist open house thing. And we have one in the summer and we have like one in the winter. And um, I managed to get like a place in the open houses to show these pieces and um so it's like the end of 2011 I'd also started working for the charity that I work for now as well and um I remember sort of showing them in this space and kind of um I was sort of uh invigilating the space as well because um it just meant that I got the space a, you know a much cheaper rate and um these people were kind of like looking at my work and um these two women were like oh I wouldn't want to have the mind that made those <laughs> and I just remember being like completely and utterly gutted by it it was just like oh and I actually stopped making stuff for a couple of years and then um part of my job at the time with the charity I worked for was kind of like I was working as a peer support specialist and a lot of the stuff we did with people was just like talking about well you know despite of or in spite of all you know your difficulties kind of like what makes your life worth living what do you like to spend your time doing what would you like to do and um I kind of just realized that I really wanted to do art but I wasn't doing it and I thought well if I'm sort of doing this work with people where I'm sort of you know going oh you know you can do this you can do that if you really want to it's just like felt I thought well you know you should do it yourself um and so I did, I just started kind of um, drawing again. And I felt kind of really, um, I don't know, I was kind of having a lot of mood swings at the time where I was going like really up and then really down. And I found that during the kind of times when I was really up, I'd like email places like the Tate and go, look at my work, you should show my work. And it was just like, which I feel really, really embarrassed about now, but kind of, um, yeah, it happened. But for every kind of like, <laughs> place that I would mail stuff to every so often like somebody would um email back and um sort of look at say my drawings you know were okay and all this kind of stuff and um I, eventually I got in contact with this studio in Frankfurt and she said to me um about your drawings would make really good embroideries and this whole thing like just kicked off in my head and I remember kind of like stuff from my childhood where because my mom used to make like clothes like for my sister and what have you she was a really good dressmaker and I remembered um kind of sitting with her as a kid and she'd give me like um like a bit of fabric and draw a picture on it and a big darning needle and wool and just say color it in with the wool and all this kind of came flooding back to me and so I just kind of um literally started kind of drawing designs on bits of fabric collaging them together because I liked the idea of it having layers, lots of different thin layers that kind of gave it strength, but durability at the same time, and just literally started colouring them in. And over the years, I mean, kind of, I mean, really, that is kind of basically still what I do. I just kind of colour things in with threads and wool and make fabric collages. But um, yeah, I mean, that is kind of like the crux of my art practice, where it comes from. And for me, combined with like my Buddhist practice, gives me a lot of imagery so kind of um although the pieces are kind of they they have like they work on different levels I guess it's like um they have directly personal meanings to me and I don't always quite understand what that is to begin with but because 
embroidery is a slow process sort of as I'm working on it kind of um the meaning of the image for me personally will kind of come through and I find it quite um therapeutic um and it sort of yeah it makes my life richer but the more I work on it as well the more I realize that actually although these are personal they have kind of quite a a universal meaning it's sort of like all human beings experience similar things maybe in different ways but still similar and um so for me it's this kind of connection between sort of myself as an individual and kind of like other people really it makes me feel less isolated I guess um yeah I mean I guess that is the crux of my practice I mean kind of like um I don't know I mean do people I'm quite, I, I mean, really, the way I was kind of thinking of doing this is just kind of explaining a little bit of background and then opening it out to people and just, you know, ask if people want to ask questions, please go ahead and maybe, you know, show some of my work to you. So I don't know what you guys think. Yeah. I'd love to see some of your work. Okay. Yeah, I've got the um, images ready if you wanted to go. That would be really great. Um, thank you by the way that was that was uh, really inspiring um, hearing your story by the way thank you thank you i'm a bit nervous i kind of tend to go quite fast when i'm nervous so i hope it sort of made sense yeah it did and no, yeah. you, you, you could tell um also when you said um how it brought back the um the memory of when you were young and that that moment it's um <coughs> art often does that doesn't it so send you back to a moment that's special mm. sort of thing yes yes i think i put them in order as they sent them but i can always mm. flip through. it doesn't actually matter really i guess it's kind of um so this piece is really, um, I made this in 2019, I think Ooh. it was. So, so this piece is really about the, the, the background story that I just sort of um, explained. It's sort of, um, yeah, oh yeah. That also kind of like, it really helps to kind of like look at my work because um, it rem there's always loads of shit I forget. So it's kind of, um, yeah. So I'll explain all the imagery kind of like as we go along um so, so each image will have like its own story so for instance like in this piece you've got the bird so that's the other part of uh, my art practice which I suppose sounds a bit weird but kind of um quite, quite often I'll, I'll sort of base stuff on like dream images as well um so the bird came from um it, it's a bit weird really it's um I had this dream of um, a bird, sort of a tiny little bird struggling to get out of um, a water pipe, sort of like this water pipe was gushing, like loads of water and this tiny little bird was in it. And I could see that it was really struggling and I was kind of quite concerned about it in the dream. And then kind of um, in the dream, it sort of did manage to fly away. And I kind of woke up and I was really inspired by that. But there was a couple of, um, over a few days after that, it was like, um, two strange I suppose like synchronicities or coincidences whatever you want to call them that occurred one of them being sort of like um, my cat sort of I think it was the day after brought in um, what looked like a dead bird as cats do and um, kind of it was lying in the hallway it was my cat Millie because she never um, they always just look, look like they're sleeping when she kind of brings in a bird my other cat you just find a head or something um, but sort of like, so Millie brought this little bird in and kind of like, I just took it back out in the garden, put it in a flower pot. It was quite cold, I remember that. And um, I felt really like, <laughs> really bad for this bird. So kind of like I went out and I wasn't sure if it was alive or not, or just shocked. And so kind of like, I put it in um, like one of the cat's carry cases with some like um, bedding and some sort of like bird seeds because we've got a bird feeder in the garden and like a, a little thingy of water. And I just kind of like put it next to the shrine in my studio and left it. And then the next morning when I got up, kind of um, it was flying around in my studio. It got out for like the gaps in the um, cage. 
and um, I opened like the window just here and sort of like it flew out into the conservatory and then I just opened the doors and it just like flew off and I was like oh wow that's like really weird and then um, a couple of days after that I have a friend who makes uh, like ceramics and she came round for like for dinner she knew nothing about this and she brought me around this beautiful ceramic bird and I was just like oh my god this is really weird so kind of like I just thought well I need to start using the bird in my um, work and for me it just like represents the ability to have like an overview on things so it's kind of like I find that um, I guess this is the other thing kind of like um, with art and combining it with my Buddhist practice it gives me a, a, an overview of my of my situation so kind of like um, I can sort of see a way forward with stuff um, obviously it's blue because kind of um, for me sort of like the bird and the sky are not kind of particularly separate and it carries like a, a heart on its back and sort of like um, the heart has like three crosses and the three crosses represent three different sort of traumatic experiences and three different people um, so it kind of carries that um, and it's wearing a crown because it's a royal bird I think kind of there's something very um, powerful and also I often research the images after and kind of like you know I mean bird imagery is like really it's it's really old and it's sort of like it all seems to point towards sort of this idea of the soul and what have you the little dog um the dog started off as a wolf initially and um I was really quite scared of it I guess kind of um it had a lot of negative connotations for me um but over time sort of like working with it it sort of um, became a dog and for me it represents instinct and sort of the ability to be fierce but um, and to sometimes be aggressive but kind of um, in a controlled way rather than just sort of completely freaking out and the little um, shine decline sleep repeat thing is just really like um, the cycles of life you know kind of like you have these huge great cycles that are universal in length like you know one day the universe will come to an end or sun will burn out and then we have like much smaller cycles that happen within our own individual lives you know whether that be mood cycles or seasons or what have you and kind of like we're all part of that because we're all nature really I guess um yeah and sort of like just the design of that is really I suppose how I felt in the car like everything kind of falling apart so um yeah so that's that piece. Just a note of content warning on the next one as well. Um, I think it has images of imagery of symbolism around death and um, suicide. Um, and sorry, Anthony, what size are they? Are they, um, are they quite small or large? So like the last piece, I would say, how do you guess that? Right, okay, it's probably about, crikey. I would say 110 centimetres by about 80 centimetres, so quite big. Yeah. Yeah. Um, this piece here is probably the biggest one I've ever made. Um, so this is probably 180 by about 130 or something like that. Wow. Um, so with these ones, I kind of, what I do is sort of, I, I, I kind of chunk it so it's kind of like um I'm, it's almost like a plea case so each of the little yeah. um characters I'll do individually yeah. um and then just like attach them onto the background yeah it's very um, sort of in the tradition of um of blankets and you know loving pieces of history stitched cool. together it's that's what attracts me I was I, I'll follow you on Instagram um and it's the it's the more or patchworky ones that I always am drawn to um and sort of get drawn into the stories but I'm I'm pleased they're that big it's kind of it's made me feel happy <laughs> oh thank you thank you so yeah so this piece is called um what it means to be us is not to be them so kind of like I'm quite interested in the ideas of sort of what separates people rather than what unites them and almost kind of like how as human beings we do tend to focus on our differences quite a lot rather than sort of like the things that make us the same you know because we're all human beings at the end of the day so kind of like um I kind of 
got with the idea of sort of like choosing things that don't fly, <laughs> things that do, but also each of them have kind of like individual meanings for me. So like I've already explained like the little dog. Um, so like the snake kind of um, for me represents kind of, um, cause it's always in contact with the ground. It represents sort of like feelings. So it kind of feels the tremors of, of that come through the floor, you know, kind of like it can feel things coming nearby to it just by feeling. So it's kind of this um, almost like archetypal image of sort of feeling the little TV with the balaclava in it. So like the TV for me represents um, kind of like, a, well, our culture really, sort of like what we're fed, sort of, um, you know, whether it be advertising, television programmes, you know, sort of it's just constant bombardment with it. And it, even more so these days. And the balaclava is almost like, um, it's like a shadow figure. So it's, um, so it represents, I suppose, kind of the parts of ourselves that we want to remain hidden, but also the parts of our culture that want to remain hidden, the more manipulative parts. And I think kind of there is a lot of media manipulation and, you know, buy this and you'll be happy. And, you know, it's a lot of bullshit really, I think, but. Um, Can I ask, how, it, how do you get that symbolism? How do you, how do you conceptualize that symbolic thinking? Does the drawing come first and then you think that looks like that idea or does the idea come and then you create the drawing from the idea? So I suppose in some ways, so like each, so like the television, for instance, kind of, um, they all have like, you know, in the, in the root of them, it's kind of like, it's because I've had some experience with them. So it's like the television, like when I was a teenager, I had like um, a drug induced psychosis and kind of like, I remember sort of seeing all these like shadowy images coming out of the television and what have you. And so kind of that's always like stuck with me. But um, also for me, it represents sort of culture because that's kind of what I grew up with. Oh, you yeah. know, I was kind of stuck in front of a television as a kid yeah. a lot. But and when like, you were doing the art, did you sit down and think what would symbolize that thought? Um, I don't think I did consciously, it's sort so it of, the, I suppose like um, the imagery kind of like, again, it kind of connects me with my Buddhist practice, so it's kind of like a lot of time I'll get like imagery that crops up in my mind and sometimes it's just let it go, let it go, and then every so often an image will come up and I'm just kind of like, oh, ooh, that feels like different, so I'll mm -hmm. kind of like make a note of it or do a little sketch of it and kind of like either work with it straight away or put it away for a later day. Um, does so Buddhism, I guess that Buddhism have that in its culture. Does Buddhism symbolize use symbols like that? It, um, I mean, it does have symbols in it, but it's not a it's not a Buddhist symbol. It's just kind of like because the way it works for me, I guess, is sort of like um, in my yeah, you know, it's kind of the way I envision it is a bit like um, you know, like mineral water. It's kind of it's all water, but kind of like in different parts of the country you've got different sort of levels in the, and different types of soil. So you'll get like a different taste. Definitely. So it's just kind of what's filtering through my psyche, I guess. Um, <coughs> and like using it creatively. Um, I don't know if that sort of makes sense really. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's kind of like the TV and what have you. The elephant comes from a memory of sort of my grandmother's kitchen and sort of like she used to have like this shelf that went around the top and she used to collect elephants so mm. it, it reminds me of memory and sort of also um hanging on to the past quite a lot um the flies represent sort of um i suppose kind of recycling because flies recycle stuff you know they eat dead stuff Mm -hmm. They kind of, but also they use medically, kind of like that, you know, you can produce oh, like yeah. special medical maggots to clean out wounds. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of um, felt quite poignant to me. The star represents um, like ongoing cycles of, you know, life and death, you know, light. Do they deliberately have five points? Um, probably not deliberately, deliberately, but kind of like from a design point of view, yeah. Just kind of, I like the idea of it being triangles. I quite yeah. like symmetry in a sort of weird, wonky way. Um, yeah. I realised uh, it's gone past five minutes. Is it okay if I skip to the next? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, also, I think we've got a question from Lawrence as well. Um, yeah, um, sorry. It was just really interesting how you mentioned like your Buddhist practice and how 
you in a lot of ways understand things by like comparing things to other things and it kind of like I was thinking in a lot of spirituality they kind of talk how you know the universe or consciousness was kind of one and then to experience itself it started to split so it could almost like identify itself by comparison is that something that's influenced your work or like your practice in buddhism um like i just yeah Mm, that's a really good question i think um yes i would say that kind of um i mean as human beings kind of like um obviously we're all individual and kind of like um we're all human that connects us but you know we're all completely unique because we've all got completely unique sort of um you know parentage and sort of life experiences you know just it's, we're just completely unique but at the same time incredibly connected I think with the um thing about you know sort of oneness I mean for me I kind of my understanding is that kind of um you know whatever life is and I, I really have no real clue what it is but kind of um I think there's there is this like you know i call it Buddha nature whatever but kind of this Mm -hmm. like um, inherent creative benign force for want of a better you know way of explaining it and I think that pervades everything but I think kind of um, I think it has to be tapped into Mm -hmm. rather than sort of I think it's just there all the time but I think we have to tap into it but I quite like the idea of also duality and kind of like that there are conflicting things because I think for me personally, if I look internally, it's generally when I'm conflicted about something or trying to balance different views, that's where a lot of creativity comes from. It's mm. like sparks in a way. Mm-hmm. So um, I don't know if that answered the question really. <laughs> no, that's <laughs> great, thank you. No, that was, that was great, thank you, yeah. <laughs> oh yeah, I'll, I'll talk about this one now. Um, so yeah this is kind of like the dog thing again um hello john hello did you want to ask a question yeah where was it was it this artwork <clears throat> sorry i didn't catch that where was the artwork made up where do i make it <clears throat> yeah and how all oh, it- right okay so um generally I mean I make it all at home here in in this room which is a pigsty at the moment because I sort of work my my sort of day job from it as well but um so basically I mean it's all made out of scrap fabrics whether it's old clothing or things that people give me um things that I find um I I like using scraps and so what I'll do is um initial at the moment like my way of working is like I like using felt as a backing because I like the feel of it. It's nice to work with. And I'll collage the background and then stitch it all together. And then generally, like the imagery, like the dog, for instance, on this one, um, I will sort of um, do that separately. So I might do it on like a, I don't know, an old blanket or an old piece of calico. And I'll just, because it's just easier to handle. And um, I'll either collage it or, and then start embroidering it um can be quite a slow process and then what I do is I'll cut it out and then um applique it onto the background and um as I go along I generally add add things to it as well because kind of um I'll have associations that come up when I'm working and so I'll just add them onto it which is the nice thing about working slowly because it means that um you've got time to think about what you're doing and then you can sort of like um yeah just change it and tweak it um it becomes like an ongoing process. So yeah, so yeah, this one is um, yeah, this one's really cool. It's um about not wanting to be house trained, really. Um, it's this idea about um, I think we can all relate to it, really. Um, not wanting to um, I don't like being told what to do really (laughs) Um, you know kind of you know obviously sometimes you have to do what you're told and you know it's good for you and all this kind of stuff but I suppose on a a deeper level I I don't like being told what to think I like to make up my own mind and have my own experiences about things I think um, if you can experience something yourself then 
you know what it is. And so, yeah, it's that's what this piece means for me as well. It's um, I'm kind of fighting for that as well and telling people to back off when you need to. Yeah. I like how you mix the uppercase and lowercase because that's what I do all the time by mistake. <laughs> Ah, well, there's a reason for this. Um, yeah, I, I like the idea because I'll be, um, like uppercase letters generally sort of signify the beginning of a new sentence and it's kind of quite prescribed. And I like the idea that you can have a new beginning anywhere. Yeah. So it's kind of, um, yeah, I like mixing them up. Does, do, do you sort of, oh, sorry. I was going to say, is it all hand stitched or is it machine stitched? Oh, it's all done by hand. Um, yeah, I, I don't actually know how to use a sewing machine. Uh huh. It looks like it's sewn. It's so small and petite. It's lovely. It is. Thank very you. well made. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I was just wondering if things happen by accident with you, Anthony. You know, whether you always know what every image is there for or whether things just kind of fly into the piece sometimes yeah they do um yeah sometimes um I'll, I'll make a piece and I kind of just halfway through think I, I really don't like this I don't, I don't know why I'm making it I don't throw it away or anything but I generally just put it away for a while and I might go back to it later and then I'll be like now it makes sense and I can continue yeah. with it or I might just like cut it up and make it part of something else and I really like those probably are my favourite pieces because it's kind of like, I suppose it's like the accident of the last piece or the bit that didn't work yeah. becomes something else. And it actually, um, I almost feel like, ah, it was meant for this piece. It wasn't meant to be a piece on its own. Yeah. But also, I guess, um, like sometimes I'll put something on a piece and I'm just like, oh, God, I wish I hadn't put that on there. So I'll patch it over. And, or I might stitch over it and I think, oh, I really like that more now. Um, yeah. yeah, so yeah, there are accidents in it, but um, I kind of just think it's a bit like life and it's like, you know, we don't know what's going to happen. So it's about how do you incorporate it and get the most out of it? Yeah. Um, yeah. Do you find that, like you were talking about like your journey, I guess, do you find that you find new things out about yourself through that yes. process? Yes, um, I, I guess kind of, uh, I mean, some of them are good, some of them not so good. Um, yeah, I mean, it is quite, um, it, it's a very reflective process, kind of like embroidery, I think. Mm. Um, and so, yeah, I, I will offer, like with the dog, for instance, the dog image, it's kind of, um, for me, yeah, I mean, at the moment, it is a dog now, but it used to be a wolf, and that for me represented, actually a lot of the time my inability to um you know I'd have a lot of rage and kind of my inability to actually kind of use that constructively so um I found as I found ways and means of which to sort of like you know regulate my moods a bit more that yeah. kind of um it, it you know the wolf turned into a dog I could still kind of bark and you know yeah. bite and stuff but you know you become indiscreet. domesticated though. <laughs> yes, but not completely. I no, do it's not still there. <laughs> the call of the wild anytime. <laughs> yes. Good to have Would a you, bit of the wild there. Absolutely. Do you plan it out on paper first? Sometimes I do. Um, like if it feels very really, really urgent, I'll do like a sketch or a painting um, and kind of I might then put it away until I want to use it but um, if it's really something an image that kind of comes up and I think I really have to make that kind mm -hmm. of I'll just start straight away and I, I kind of can see it in my head how I want it to be um, but yeah I do make sketches quite a lot. So roughly how long would that this piece have taken to make? So that piece I think took about um, two weeks on and off I mean I don't kind of work all day every day on stuff mm -hmm. like um yeah probably about two weeks you know sort of some days I work a really really long time on something and then some days might only work a couple of hours in the evening um but yeah I would say for a piece that size about two weeks can I ask another one yeah 
Just wondering about, um, you know, what you're saying earlier about those two women who said they didn't want to be in your mind. Yes. Um, how do you feel about comments like that now? Can you are you more equipped for that now, or can you absorb um, it in work? Or who you I think to be in their mind. <laughs> <laughs> how do I, I? I mean, I'm still. Yeah, I mean, things like that still, um, ups yeah, they do upset me, you know, kind of, um, well, like everybody else, I just want to be sort of, you know, accepted for who I am. Yeah. But at the same time, I kind of think, um, I mean, I would, I mean, I certainly wouldn't let it stop me doing something now, like I did back then. Mm. Um, and I just kind of think, well, actually, you're only getting, uh, you know, a piece of of, of of who I am and actually a lot of art is kind of you know people project on artwork all the time exactly. yeah so yeah uh, you know it is about actually kind of maybe what more about them than me but yeah it's still kind of um yeah it hurts my feelings sometimes but yeah. at the same time it's amazing that you got something across to those women that yeah. gave a reaction like that that's incredible and it's not just a you know what I mean? Well, they I were wrong, it, but yeah. They had a reaction. That's incredible. Because it is a dialogue, isn't it? And I think if you put something out there, it's something everybody experiences in one form or another is the public reaction or or even the personal reaction from people around you and your family and your friendship circles. Um mm. about what that then makes them think about you or say to you as a result of seeing your work can something we all have to develop isn't it how we kind of respond to that yes i completely agree and you've got to remember uh, the reason why they don't want to be in the mind might not be a negative <laughs> thing you know what i mean they probably just didn't go with their sofa that's what it yeah. is it's like yes. it didn't yeah it wouldn't match the cushions mary <laughs> <laughs> yeah no. i don't know it's it's a strange one i, I kind of um I mean, personally, artwork that I really enjoy is kind of always something that gives me a reaction, like an immediate gut response. Yeah. Um, and, and that's kind of, I didn't actually think of it like that, but um, it elicited a response from them. So yeah, thank you for that. Um, I hadn't actually thought about it like that. Well, I think that's what art's all about. Mm. Yeah, I agree. And you can't please all the people all the time. No. <laughs> well absolutely and I guess this is one of the therapeutic values of it as well it's kind of it has actually made me more um confident in um saying you know just being who I am and putting out what I what I see in the world or how I perceive it and people don't have to agree but um I like the idea of art being a cause for a bit like what we're doing now dialogue okay so I'll talk a little bit about this piece so um so I spoke about the bird and what the bird represents. Um, the fly, I'll just sort of give a quick recap on about this idea that it's sort of, um, I mean, they're not popular things, flies. I think they're seen quite negatively, but I think they have quite a, a, a sort of important role in life because they do sort of, um, they clear up mess and rot and decay. And also, you know, quite often the, um, you know, you can have especially medical medicalized maggots that clean out wounds in a very natural way they only eat what is kind of rotten and leave behind what is good and I kind of think there's a positive aspect to that with the fly um, and also they're quite small but you always know that they're there um, so I quite like I think yeah I've got a soft spot for flies strangely but um, the little monkey in the corner that to me sort of like that I mean this is very um, straight from Buddhism in a way and Hinduism about kind of like the idea of the monkey mind the reactive mind um, which kind of for me I really resonate with because it's kind of like I have a tendency to be like really reactive so um, for me if I can sometimes actually actualize something into an image I can understand it more and kind of um, understand myself better and sort of work with it and like the little crocodile in the corner Again, I really, I've just got a thing about crocodiles. I like the fact that kind of, um, again, they're quite dual in nature. They, they kind of, they can live in the land, but they can also live in the water. Um, and sort of, they're quite fierce, but at the same time, you know, they're so gentle with kind of like their eggs, you know, they kind of carry them really gently in their mouths. 
So there's kind of like there's these two sides to them, and I really like that. And I, there's a lot of myth around sort of um, crocodiles as well from Egypt and Africa and places like that, and um, a lot of folk tales. And I, I really like stuff like that. Um, I find that a great sort of sort of inspiration. Mm -hmm. um, oh, and the background on this as well, sort of like um, I'm quite into sort of. It's almost like magnifying the fabric. So, so like um, the weft and the warp and the weave and everything in a fabric, I like to sort of magnify it. Because I think, um, again, it alludes to different things from Buddhism. It's like, there's this thing called Indra's net. And it's kind of like, um, you know, this image of a net that connects everything. So if you pull it in one part, it will move in another. Like fabric does, if you pull a thread, it's sort of like, you pull it there and something moves over here. And I, I just kind of like this analogy of sort of, you know, the things we have in front of us, kind of the creative process is often just like a little microcosm of this big thing, this big life happening. And yeah, it sort of helps me uh, feel part of it all somehow. Yeah. So yeah, this is, um, yeah, so it's going back to like the monkey mind again. So this, these pieces I made last year, um, this is from the beginning of last year, and kind of um, in the like Buddhist practice that I do, sort of like it's a chanting practice. So it's kind of like it's Nam Yoho Renge Kyo. And like the Nam part is sort of um, means devotion to, and kind of like I had this like visual in my head of kind of like, um, almost it's like bowing to kind of like um, something bigger than your own ego and kind of um, and this visual kind of thing came up of sort of like you know sort of like the ego quite often thinks it's like the center of the universe and everything's about me and la 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 and I just had this image of kind of like it wearing this little crown and sort of like as you bow it drops off and kind of like you're left feeling lighter when always you, you know always pick it back up and pop, pop it back on again but it's um yeah this idea that sort of um it tames the monkey mind as it were to sort of um put your ego kind of not so much in the center of things and just think actually there are bigger forces in the world you know not apart from the fact there's bloody other people do you know what i mean it's kind of so you know yeah this one is very much about sort of life isn't all about you really or me um yeah Got, um, a question from Lawrence as well, if that's okay. Yeah. Um, hi, hi. Um, yeah, it was just you were talking about like um, the school of Buddhism um, that you've kind of um, chosen already resonated with, and I was kind of wondering how you got to like that school. Did you kind of explore Buddhism in different branches, um, like of Buddhism, or kind of what was your journey to that practice? Um, and how did you find it was the right practice for yourself? Okay. Um, well, I first came across it when I was 17. Um, and it sounds really naff, but kind of it was like through watching the Tina Turner film, um, What's Love Got to Do With It? And um, I was, yeah, 17. I was kind of mentally incredibly unwell at the time. Um, like, yeah, quite dark days. And I remember sort of watching it like really late one night, my mom had it on video. And I remember at the start of the film kind of like, um, it kind of it comes up about it kind of Nami Harenge Kyo and you could sort of hear this chanting in the background. And I was just like, oh my God, what is that? It really just like resonated with me. And then as the story went on, I kind of resonated with the story and kind of like how, you know, sort of traumatized she was. and and how it helped and I, it kind of just stuck in my mind and I, I didn't sort of like pick it up straight away but I did find that I would just kind of do just do it sporadically every so often um, and that I did on and off up until I was about 28 and then I was in when I was 28 I was living in Scotland I was at a college in Scotland called New Battle Abbey and um, I'd got myself into loads of debt <laughs> kind of doing this course um and yeah I yeah I was in a bit of a tight spot and I remember because I don't really like doing academic work very much or anything like that so I had this like little gym and um there was a magazine in it and it was like a buddhist magazine and it was about this pra chanting practice so I just thought 
well I've got nothing to lose and I just started doing it every day and I've done it every day ever since because it just changes the way I feel about things um like I can wake up in the morning and feel like shit absolute shit and I know that if I ch chant for half an hour an hour whatever it me you know I need to do I will feel differently and also I'll have a better perspective um and that's why I do it I mean I basically because it worked for me so far really um um and the longer I've done it the sort of more depth I, I feel like I've got towards it somehow um yeah um so Tina just, Turner <laughs> <laughs> I was just wondering quickly another question sorry um have you found that consistently like meditation or chanting has worked or has there been periods where it's worked more and worked less? And there has been periods where it's been more difficult to feel in tune. How have you kind of navigated those? If, if you want to talk about it, of course. Oh, no, 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 of course. I would say that, uh, yeah, there are times where it's much, much harder. Um, I mean, apart from sort of um, doing that, there's several things that I find really work for me like as an individual so the chanting is part of it um but the other parts of it are kind of like I find um therapy really useful and talking mm -hmm. to people and being able to talk about stuff um and I also find working in peer support really useful because it's um that whole thing about kind of you actually really do help yourself by helping other people or supporting other people a it just stops you kind of thinking about your own problems for a while and you feel good because you've supported somebody else um, with their problems. So all those things together, I find really, really useful. Um, I could say to me like, oh, I do exercise, but I don't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so, <laughs> so yeah, those three things I find really, really beneficial. Cool, that's great, thank you. Just, think, just thinking about the backgrounds of some of your pieces is very much kind of like gameplay as well like a chessboard or um is that a part of it or or is it again it could be a reference to traditional <coughs> quilting <laughs> i don't know um i suppose in a way it's kind of i like the idea of um again it's like i suppose duality i like the idea of um i can't think of the right word um not conflict but kind of Contrast. contrast contrast that's the word I like contrasting things I like um yeah I like there to be contrast but also it, again it's this idea of kind of it's like almost blowing up the fabric so it's kind of like the darker bits are the actual threads and like the lighter bits are kind of the, the gaps the, in the in the um in the fabric that you'd see under a microscope perhaps so um I like this idea of kind of you know I suppose you know, physics in kind of you know sort of we're just like atoms you know with lots of empty space and we're all just buzzing so it's a little bit like that um that's the sort of shit I think about when I'm doing this <laughs> um but yeah so really for me it's about amplifying the actual material itself yeah yeah ah so this one um so kind of like the ghost image for me represents again in Buddhism they have this idea of the hungry ghost um, and for me I've kind of um, taken it for my own sort of personal way of kind of being about um, always searching for things outside of myself kind of um, and when I do that it's, an, it's it, you know sort of temporarily sort of satisfies and then I'm like you know like on Instagram or Facebook it's like how many likes did I get and that whole kind of thing of always just looking outside and not actually looking inwards and um for me it's kind of like the again referencing sort of other things like I was brought up Catholic so you've got the thing about kind of like the Holy Spirit the Holy Ghost and this idea that um actually you know kind of having a hole inside or you know that you're trying to fill or avoid can actually be um a really good gateway to actually exploring yourself so it kind of um yeah, it's, I don't see it particularly as a negative. It can be, but it's not always. Um, with this particular piece, um, I like the idea, again, of like the image of the traditional ghost, the sheet on, because it's kind of like, 
again referencing like the fabric you know I like you know that's what I work with but also the fact that if you took it away there'd be nothing underneath and it's almost kind of like um, the sheet can be a story um, and kind of we can change the story it's sort of like we can work with it um, that's how I feel about it anyway and again the TV is like a little reference to the idea of that kind of in our culture I feel that we're not um, really given the opportunity to get to know ourselves because um, again it it likes to fill in all that void you know with kind of you know crap and the little um, cloud is about kind of you know sort of as a reference to sort of like the eye cloud and I find it really weird that kind of there's a some sort of oh, obviously I know it's not a real cloud but like this cloud with information in it it's quite a, a strange thing I think and but it's always used kind of almost to against us in a way to kind of you know what did they look at let's give them an advertisement for it and um this little cross thing in the corner that for me represents um this observing aspect of ourselves, the bit that can, we can observe kind of what we're doing um what we're thinking and um yeah the rainbow i guess is really from kind of like the whole nhs thing because it's just been around i've sort of soaked it up um and also to have a rainbow, you need to have special circumstances. The right things need to be there for it to happen. And I, I just like that idea that, um, yeah, special things. You know, you have to have a bit of rain and a little bit of sunshine and some cloud. It's not kind of like for, for a rainbow to occur and it's really beautiful. So you have to have all these different things occurring internally sometimes for something beautiful to come out. So yeah, that's kind of, um, and the blue background is also about sort of um, there's a thing in Buddhism called shunyata and it's like the big empty blue sky and everything that's manifest comes from this blue sky it's um yeah that's kind of that really oh it's the balaclava um yeah again it's just this idea of kind of <laughs> I, I kind of I don't know why but I think of like Trump when I kind of look at that yeah. it's kind of like um just this idea that um again it's this idea that we you know power well and this piece is called kind of those that seek power should first seek themselves and it's just this idea that kind of seeking power a generally people that seek it are really the people I think that shouldn't but also kind of being you know having an inward look at myself and looking at the parts of myself that are like that which is I suppose going back to that thing earlier about finding things out about yourself and I suppose that is one of the perhaps not so pleasant things that I see in myself that is kind of like yeah actually I have you know a little bit of a trunk in me somewhere perhaps where you know it's about people um the human I think kind of tendency to try and um, get one over on other people, or get what you want above everybody else, and you know, fuck what happens to that person, that sort of thing. So for me, it's sort of, um, yeah, I suppose being mindful of that aspect in myself and kind of, because I think if you can see it, you can sort of work with it. And again, it's actually got, um, if you took the balaclava off, it would have just like the blue sky underneath it again. Yeah. and I just like those colours as well. Um, so this one, what is a box? So yeah, this is basically just saying, you know, for me, it's kind of like when you say what something is or what somebody is, you're putting them in a box. And I think culturally we have a tendency to do this. I was thinking more along, I suppose, the lines when I was making this around sort of issues around mental health and sort of diagnosis. So it's kind of like you're bipolar you're schizophrenic, you're this, you're that. And it's like, it's boxing and labeling, but then it's sort of like, then it seems to be just left. It's like, that is what you are. And then it's kind of like, well, why? That seems to be the logical step for me. It's like, well, why is this the way it is? Why is that the way it is? And I feel in our culture, that doesn't really happen so much. It's, we're very good at labeling, but not exploring as the reason why. So it's this idea that, um, by asking the right questions you actually unlock the box and kind of you know yeah are, are allowed spaciousness and freedom to kind of um not be a label yeah 
And this is one of those pieces that was made out of um, a piece that didn't work. So I just kind of cut it up into squares and kind of like, yeah, rearranged it a bit. That in itself adds like a an extra layer of texture to it though, doesn't it? Like it's an extra layer of detail because you've made this whole thing that you then didn't like and it actually cutting it up, that's already got like a full piece's worth of detail in it. Mm. And you put it sort of layers up on top of each other. I really like this one. Yeah. I really like that one as well. And I think it's because for me, if you don't mind me expressing my own <laughs> feelings yeah. towards it, it's about you developing as a craftsperson as well. You know, like you're developing like a, quite a traditional <coughs> craft and your skills yes. are clearly growing. Um, and, you know, you can see that progression um, as well you. as the, the message, which is fascinating. And it just, it just, you just want to look at it and read it and absorb it and look at it again. And, but I really appreciate the sort of the level of uh, intricacy you've got in your stitch patterns. I like the idea of yeah. it being a blanket sort of a, a feel. Which yeah I, I have to say I am quite influenced at the moment and have been for about a year now by quilt making like in its traditional form yeah um, I'm, I'm fascinated by it I think it, I, I like the idea of it you know it's a very comforting thing um, mm. that's a strong sense of community as well doesn't it you know like a community craft yes or something that you know brings people together or that you can share and I think yes. that's why I like it so much because it's it's obviously it's got a lot of truth in it, which can be hard. Um, but it also has a kind of a, a feeling of, um, you know, it is what it is. And this is where we are. And, and it's generally OK. <laughs> mm. I do a lot of actual machine quilting, like the traditional making a big patchwork quilt type deal. Um, and that's mm. exactly what it is for me. It's about like I made one for my mom, not last Christmas, Christmas before. And it was... Yeah. The finished quilt was about a two meter square, but it's representative of about 35 hours of being sat at a machine like it's a yeah. it's a it's an actual physical representation of love when you make something like that. Yeah. That's kind of yeah. what I like about your work. It does speak to me quite a lot. Some very heavily into textiles and stuff as a thing like and I've not even thought about trying to tell stories with it as well. Like it's it's really interesting to me. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, I, I think actually in all it, 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 I think when people anybody makes anything, I think there's always an element of story in it somewhere um, because I, I, I don't think because I don't think they can't. I don't think it, it could be you could make something and it not be a story in some capacity because it's kind of like, you know, it's the motivation to pick up, you know, you know go to your sewing machine pick the fabrics it's kind of like I suppose for me I kind of I question everything I do all the time it's like well why did I do that why am I doing this why am I doing that and so yeah. that's how I kind of pick out I suppose like the story but I think all artwork contains a story to a degree mm. yeah I have I have a question about um this uh, what is a box, why is a key, which I love actually, but are those letters, are they embroidered on or cut from the fabric and sewn on? And my other question is, I mean, do you pick the fabrics? Are they um, of emotional significance to you, like from old clothing or is it new material? Okay, so first question is, yeah, they're all embroidered um uh, I, yeah sometimes i do cut out um wording from like fabric but these this particular piece is all embroidery okay. um and with the fabric it's a mixture of both um i mean some like fabrics i do use a lot of old clothing um i've got a, I, well it's not so much these days but i used to have a thing about stripes um and I, I wanted to include stripes in all of my work. I mean, I don't do that now, but for me, it sort of represented this kind of thing of like, um, again, duality, it's like life and death, sleeping, waking, consciousness, unconsciousness, all this kind of stuff. But um, yeah, I guess some fabric I've got has an emotional resonance to me because it's kind of, you know, it's stuff that I've got from my mom or, you know, it's from kind of old clothing or stuff even, you know, that, my grandma had or something 
um, and then other bits and pieces I might just you know get from you know offcuts from like fabric shops or um, old pillowcases if like I don't know if like I find an old pillowcase in the cupboard and I think I really like the colour I'll just like nick it I mean it's my pillowcase so I guess it's not nicking it really but um, yeah kind of uh, yeah I just repurpose a lot of stuff but I also do buy like fabric you know but generally it's always off cuts unless I see something really amazing and then I'll buy it mm -hmm. but I do buy felt for backing that's always I always buy quite a lot of that just on that with um mm -hmm. you talk about the felt and the backing and stuff do you tend to put like a padded filler between the layers or anything or is it just the front fabric the back fabric sort of sewn together it's literally it's just kind of like um the front part and the um and the felt behind it um because it does give a sort of quilty effect um mm. and i also like I, I mean i always buy kind of like it sounds a bit weird but like th this particular shade of blue because i like the idea of it's like this this the sky thing and this is kind of mm. manifesting out of the sky um coming out of you know nowhere as it were um so even that's got a little bit of significance to me but in some ways it's because i'm lazy and i don't want to do like the sort of the like proper quilty quilty thing um because <laughs> what's good the thing i like about this one is it looks like you've done that like when you look at the um on the darker purpley squares and stuff where you've got the so many little individual stitches that i'm incredibly impressed you've done by hand um but it looks like it's got that padded culture between them like it it's got that slight raised effect and it looks really sort of plush is maybe is the word i'm looking for like yeah i th yeah that's um i mean it's kind of kind of accidental that i started using felt because before i was using calico and i'd just like run out and obviously because we're all in lockdown i didn't have anything to use but and then i found a big piece of felt that i bought kind of ages ago and I thought, well, I'll use that because I'm not really going to use it for anything else. And I, I liked that kind of effect. And it sort of does give like a really good quilty effect because I suppose in a way it's a bit um, a bit like thinner. Um, it's quite durable as well. The last hmm. image, so shall I switch it off and carry on the discussion? Yeah. yeah. OK. So do you sew through to the felt then you you go through the fabric and then sew into the felt? Yes, yes. Yeah. So kind of um, I'll kind of um, cut out the felt and then kind of like have a maybe, you know, a slightly large piece of fabric and then start collaging on top um, and then sort of hand stitch it all and add the imagery and what have you. Um, yeah. Like so do you hands. improvise as you go or do you have it sort of sketched out already what you want to do? So sometimes it's a bit of both. Um, <laughs> like, so some pieces I will, um, you know, if I, I'm not inspired to make something or kind of I haven't got anything burning in my mind that I really want to make, I'll, I'll kind of, you know, go through like old drawings and stuff and like pick a piece. So sometimes it is like from a drawing that I've done like, you know recently or maybe a year or two ago um and then there are times where it's literally i just have an idea and i'll just work straight onto the fabric and kind mm. of it all just comes comes mm. out because there's usually when that happens that i've got quite yeah I, I can sort of almost see it how i want it to look in my mind mm. all right um, yeah. thank you i love that um the way that, that you've been stitched, it feels like mark making, it feels like your touch, you can, in your style, it, almost like a painting with brush marks. Um, I just think that's amazing. Um, but also just, it makes me want to touch it. What's your, what's your thought about touch within a gallery space as well? Is it made to be touched or is it made to be viewed? Um, I actually um, don't mind people touching my work. Um, I think it's always been like whenever um, I remember a friend of mine like, when I first showed him like the first pieces I ever made and that was his immediate response he just wanted to touch it and go oh you know because it is very tactile um, but also I find um, I mean I did um, showed some work 
was not last year, the year before, and one of the uh, artists I showed with, she was blind. And she was able to kind of like really appreciate what I'd done because she could feel it. And um, it was, yeah, I, I, I hadn't really thought of it from that perspective before, but yes, it's kind of, um, yeah, she was able to really enjoy it. And um, so, yeah, I'm really happy for people to kind of touch it really. Um, it's good to hear because looking at everything that you've shown today, it invites that to me. Like, <laughs> if I went to see it somewhere, I would. That would be my immediate sort of want to. It looks like you want to touch it because, like I say, it's quite sort of push and soft look. Hmm. I think that's the thing about textiles, though, isn't it? Because it is kind of. Um, I, I think inherently, it's really comforting. There is kind of, um, you know, because we use it to kind of clothe our bodies, we use it to sleep under, we, you know, we furnish our homes with it. It's such a sort of um, accessible thing. It's not like, um, I mean, I love painting, but it's kind of like a painting doesn't keep you warm. Maybe, well, maybe it does metaphorically, but kind of, a, but yeah, there is something incredibly um, human, I think, about kind of textiles, because it's so old as well. It's such an old thing. Ever thought of making wearable stuff? I initially kind of um, way, way back when I first, first started back in that summer when I bought the fabric scraps, that was my initial idea. I wanted to make um, T-shirt designs, mm -hmm. but I just didn't know how to do it. So kind of like what I was making was just um, too heavy to put on a T-shirt. Mm -hmm. So I just thought, you know, that's kind of what, what they are. They're collages. They're, they're not going to go on a T-shirt um i do i i do like clothing and i'm quite inspired because inspired by um things that i see in the street or kind of things that i see on television Fa fashion does okay. definitely does play into kind of my art practice i think as much as painting or other textile works do yeah i was um, going to ask what your influences were whether there was like couture as well as art do you know what i mean mm. i don't know the words but that's what i'm thinking it was the right yes. one <laughs> Yes, <laughs> I, yeah, definitely. I, I love, um, I mean, I love looking at painting. I mean, I love looking at art because it's sort of, um, it's just very nourishing and sort of like, and it sort of gives me faith in humanity because you think, oh my God, a human made that. So that's, you know, we're not all completely fucked then. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I guess kind of like influences, I, I love, um, like there's a painter, Rose Wiley, who I love. Um, I love Basquiat. I mean, oh, yeah. all these, you know, oh, yeah. I, I love really expressive painting. Um, and I suppose, I'm, yeah, I like things like Vivian Westwood because I think her clothing mm. is actually like artwork. Um, yeah. um, and sort of Japanese designers as well. I like kind of um, Yoji Yamamoto and things like that because it's quite subtle, but when you look at the clothing close up, it's just like, it's so amazing. Um, yeah. Mm. In a lot of ways, clothes aren't just functional, other they're sort of a way of expressing what's going on inside the person. So, yeah. Yes, definitely. And I think that's interesting. Um, yeah, it's, it's, I, guess, I guess it's one of those why questions again. It's like, why is that person wearing that today? And, you know, why are they, you know, or why aren't they making an effort? Or, you know, mm -hmm. yes, it is incredibly interesting. Um, are they conforming? <laughs> yes. Uh -huh. Actually, yes, that's a very good point because again, it's um, yeah, we identify people by what they wear, don't we? So, mm. Mm. I hadn't thought of it like that. Um, if there's any questions from those who've been a little bit more quieter, um, you're welcome to ask. Um, that's not to stop anyone either. I just just carry on. <laughs> yeah, I, I apologise. I can't stop asking questions. <laughs> That's great. Thank you, Michael. <laughs> In terms of the sort of clothing side of things, is that a conversation you've ever had with yourself now that you've sort of got them made? Would you be happy to see these images printed on T-shirts and sold? Or would that take away from the, the sort of textural nature of what you do? Mm. It's a strange one because I, I like um, there's a certain democracy with clothing, I think, because kind of like it, it can be available for like loads of people if they want it, it's there. But at the same time, it's kind of um, I've you know, I mean, I've tried like doing postcards with my work before and 
and it just doesn't seem to work. It, it, I don't know, it's sort of, um, there's something about, I think textiles particularly, that kind of a camera doesn't capture very well or an image doesn't capture, but um, yeah, it's, it's a weird- Because you wouldn't lose all of the layering and, mm. and stuff. And even just the little bits of raised sections where the stitching is, the shadows that that casts and things, it sort of definitely takes away a bit from the text. I was just quite because obviously a lot of people do that now. Like you can go to a thousand different websites online and just download a picture, and they print the t-shirts, send them out, all that sort of stuff. Like so, just what interesting to see if you've thought about stuff. I suppose it has crossed my mind, but I guess um, yeah, I'm not so. Yeah, it, it, it doesn't really, I suppose, yeah, it doesn't really fulfill the need in me that kind of like making the work um, does really. It's sort of, it, I like the process of making things. Um, yeah. Cool. Any tips about um, how, how to promote and kind of get your work in galleries or scene or um um have big mood swings <laughs> and kind of email people when you're a bit high um i don't know i suppose um i mean for me personally it's kind of i i just approach people um i'd say most of the times i've been rejected but every so often kind of you'll get um somebody that will say yes to something or um you know put your work in a show or something and and be connected so I, I, yeah yeah I, I suppose that would be the best thing i i mean I, I kind of um there's like websites like curator space and things like that that send opportunities and you can apply for them again quite often i don't get them but every so often i do um and I find that it has a sort of um, snowball effect. So kind of, um, you know, I mean, I mean, like the gallery that represents me now in the UK, they uh, saw my work at, uh, in a show in Brighton and sort of they just tracked it. I didn't even know they'd seen it. And then they invited me last year to um, show at the London Art Fair and then represented me. But um, so it is this kind of thing about, um, just yeah just to keep going if that's what you want to do if you want your work to be seen just to kind of not to give up on it that's what I think kind of works and every so often you'll get a break because you know that's sod's law isn't it if you just keep going every so often you will get a break um yeah and not to be too swayed I guess kind of um I guess that that, that dog image is like you know this is my work this is how I'm going to make it and I'm not going to change that um, to suit kind of um, a gallery or an exhibition or something. It's like, this is my work. So it's kind of, you either like it or you lump it really. Um, yeah. I was just gonna, a quick query as well about what was the name of the charity you worked for? Cause I'm gonna pop up a few links related to the, to the chat afterwards. So that might be okay, so I work for a charity called Recovery Partners, and uh, yeah, we're just like a little grassroots charity here in East Sussex. Um, we're kind of well, we're kind of active at the moment. Sort of, we had a a lot of our funding pulled a couple of years ago. Kind of, it was also followed up by a much bigger organisation. But yeah, we do like little um, like at the moment we're doing. Uh, I'm doing, I'm coordinating an art project for older people. Um, somebody else is running a sort of experts by experience project, sort of working um, with social work students. Um, yeah, we do kind of like little project pieces really. But we used to do a lot of, um, we had a, the biggest part of our work up until a few years ago was working one to one in the community with other people. Um, doing like recovery plans and stuff like that, doing group work, running courses, that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's a little quieter than it used to be. Well, it's um, just past half three. Um, uh, so we might draw it to a close soon. 
Yeah. Oh, so was there any burning questions some people that we might have missed from anyone? Do put up your hand. Um, but I think we've covered so much. It's been a really inspiring talk and thank you so much. Um, great discussion, brilliant work. Um, and thank you. Well, yes, thank so you for having me. And um, I hope I didn't gabble too much because I feel like I've been going about 20 million miles an hour. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? <laughs> Oh. It's been fascinating. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Yes. Thank, thank you for you. having me. Yeah, thank, thank you. you. Thank you.